Muito bem, vamos, vamos começar. Uh, uh, so let's start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miguel Barcerujo, for, for being here. This is a, uh, um, a conference in, in Zoom uh, that we call the Scientific Smack. Um, this is organized by the paleontologist at, um, at uh, uh, Nova University and Here in the room is Professor José Almeida, the head of the Department of Ciencia Terra from the university. Uh, thank you very much, José Almeida, for, by, for being present. And um, organized also by the paleontologist of, of um, Museu de Lourdes. José Almeida, do you want to say anything? I think I can speak in Portuguese, no? Of course, please. É. Uh, pronto, também para cumprimentar o professor Miguel Araújo por, por, por esta disponibilidade para vir aqui ao, ao Zoom, portanto, fazer esta palestra também em nome do departamento. Obrigado. Nosso agradecimento. Obrigado. Pronto, e desejo uma ótima conferência. Eu vou tentar assistir um bocadinho, a gente tem um outro seminário também de mestrados e, portanto, vou-me dividir aqui um bocado. Obrigado. So, uh, Miguel Araújo is a person that I, I personally admire. Um, very, very much. Um, we met about uh, um, 20 something years ago uh, when I was a, a young student and I uh, was a volunteer in his, uh, in his uh, research. We went um, measuring biodiversity in, in eucalyptus forests and, uh, and the Quercus forest to see the, to see the differences. And uh, that was a, a work um, by, by Miguel Arrujo. And um, <coughs> it also has a remarkable career, H index of 90, uh, Premio Pessoa, um, Ernest Ackle um, Award or Prize. So it's a real pleasure to have him here talking about uh, biodiversity. Thank you very much. Without further ado, Miguel, audience is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I will share my screen. Um, this will stop all the sharing, yes. I guess that's the one, share. Are you, are you seeing my screen already or not? No. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are mm -hmm. you? Yes, yeah. you're seeing that uh, beautiful landscape, yes. Um, can you see the presentation? Is it in the right place now? Uh, we see it as, as a as a user a viewer, not as public viewer, view. Está aí, mesmo em cima, tem uma coisa que diz swap displays. Yes. Do do que para mim. Exatamente. Está perfeito. Ok. So, um, well, I'll, I'll also um, like to thank um, um, Professor José uh, and Octavio, and uh, Octavio, I know him for, I mean, as he said, quite a long time. He was a kid. He was he was studying biology at at University of Evra, and you could already see um, that he was an extremely enthusiastic person, um, not doing things without uh, a very strong commitment. He was collaborating in LPN with a um, an environmental organization at the time, um, so. It's, I've been also following you, um, his career uh, with uh, enormous interest. I really like what he's doing and wish him the best for the future. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk. You're welcome. Um, so I, I, when, when Octavio uh, asked me to talk to this MSc in paleontology, I scratched my head and I started thinking, what, what should I do? I'm not a paleontologist. I'm a biogeographer. Uh, biogeography is um, traditionally has been um, presented as two different branches, um, ecological biogeography and historical biogeography. And, um, you know, they, classically, they've been kind of almost separate disciplines. Uh, there was very little contact between the two branches uh, with ecological biogeography trying to understand uh, the patterns of the distribution of life uh, in relation to contemporary uh, uh, factors and historical biogeography focusing on the evolutionary um, mechanisms underlying uh, existing patterns. Most, but most modern biogeographers nowadays, they try to integrate, uh, integrate as much as possible uh, space and time, as well as different tools. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, I have to say that I'm, I like a lot uh, 
but perhaps not so much paleontology in the sense in the classical sense but i i, I do read and uh, work a little bit on what we might call paleoecology uh, which is the 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 interface between um, ecology and, and deep time. Uh, so I have a strong interest in that and I try to integrate uh, as much as possible that knowledge into my work. Um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased also to be talking, uh, giving this lecture uh, because it's a master's organized by uh, Nova University of Lisbon and University of Evra, the two universities in Portugal with which I have some, some relationship. Nova because that's where I did my, my undergraduate studies. So I'm, I'm a graduate um, from Nova, uh, University of Lisbon and University of Ever because I've got a, a visiting appointment at the moment. Uh, I've had for, for some time and I've got a group there as well. So, um, and I, I've grown up in Ever. So it's, uh, it's, it's good to be collaborating with um, this master's program. And um, I would like to, to start by acknowledging some names. Of course, it's when you acknowledge names, you, you risk um, ignoring many others, but uh, these are not necessarily biogeographers exclusively because uh, in the past people were interested in knowledge, but we can't we can't uh, speak of biogeography without um, talking about Linnaeus. Of course, Carl Linnaeus is starting to 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 develop the mechanisms to, to catalog life. Uh, the Condol and Humboldt, they they are good examples of ecological biogeographers. Um, they've started um, to document uh, distributions of life forms, particularly plants and correlated them with um, environmental factors. And then we have, of course, uh, uh, Charles Darwin and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace um, that incorporated uh, the evolutionary dimension into understanding of the patterns of the distribution of life. Uh, I used to say as um, half joke, half uh, seriously, that uh, Humboldt is probably the grandfather of biogeography and, um, and um, Wallace the, the father of biogeography. Both had uh, tremendous important um, contributions. But these people, they, you know, especially the, the, the fourth in the bottom, they they were travelers. Um, most of the, their insight was made out of traveling around the world. And uh, but it's amazing. I mean, they they've noted uh, uh, an important pattern in life, which was that when they got out of Europe and they went to to the tropics, that how many more species existed there? How many more species there were? They were in, in, in the tropics compared to their homeland uh, in Britain or Germany or also Sweden. And, and that, so that, that, that was known since the beginning of, of the European um, travels, but perhaps even before. Uh, but it was documented by them uh, in, the, in the qualitative descriptions and narratives. And the maps that you've seen, that can, you can see in this, in this, um, in this slide here, uh, diversity gradients, uh, where you have red is many species and blue is few species. You, you're going you, you, to see this, these colors um, in many slides. And um, so that's basically the pattern, but uh, it's, it's amazing to start thinking that we only have maps like that since the beginning of the 21st century. So if you think about the history of science and the history of biogeography or biology, if you like, uh, an accurate description of the distribution of life is something that is very, very recent. So you might wonder why only now we start integrating um, temporal and spatial uh, dimensions, because only now we have actually the data that uh, enables us to do, to do this, um, to, to analyze this data. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm from the generation, I finished my PhD in 2000. I had been already working in distribution, not, not at global level, but uh, European and uh, national levels. But it was just after I finished my PhD that these maps were, um, became available. And they really marked a huge transition in the science of biogeography. So I'm, I'm one of the, the, you know, the generation of biogeographers that was lucky to be able to, to work uh, with um, data like that. that was compiled over uh, more, more than 200 years by several um, naturalists. Uh, analysis of the fossil record. We, of course, we now have a much better fossil record that, that we had in the past. And um, but analysis of the fossil record has also demonstrated that this, these patterns of diversity, uh, they somehow replicated in time. So we have here um, different uh, time series, uh, sorry, d data. Um, this is latitude. So zero is, 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 is a tropics, and this is 80 degree latitude in, in the Northern Hemisphere. And you can see that there's a tendency, this is um, bivalve data, 
a tendency for increasing uh, also diversity in the past 360 million years, 345 million years. That relationship is somehow modeled here. Uh, there's a peak in, in, at in intermediate um, uh, diversities, but then in the most recent time, you, you have again a very steep gradient, as we know for other groups of organisms. And in fact, in, in this review uh, by Rode, Klaus Rode, he, he, he argues that fossil evidence indicates that the existence of gradients, this is this legitimate gradient of diversity, uh, is time invariant. So it's been there for quite a long time. But it had uh, increased more recently, that is in the past 65 million years in the Cenozoic. <coughs> While the, the documentation of these patterns has took us you know, over 200 years, uh, we're, still, we're still battling to understand why. Why is there this pattern? And that's the focus of, the, of, of my presentation. In 2005, the magazine Science um, celebrated their uh, 125th anniversary. And they, and they published uh, a special issue uh, where they um, identified the 25 most important um, questions in science. And things like, are we alone in the universe? Or um, is there any uh, unifying laws of physics? And things like that. And one of the, one of the 25 questions was, what, determine, what determines species diversity? Uh, that is, after 200 years, we're still battling uh, to and try to understand the, the, the ultimate mechanism. And perhaps one of the problems is exactly that concept of trying to uh, understand the ultimate mechanism. Uh, there's many people I could, I could um, put in this slide here. Uh, this is just to show that this is a discussion that has been around for quite a long time. Um, there's been many discussions. Uh, there was even a paper um, claiming that there was about 100 hypotheses explaining the latitudinal gradient. But this paper uh, is now 88 years old. And he, he, he discussed about 26, uh, if I remember it was 26 um, hypotheses. And then he kind of discussed them and said, well, in the end, there's maybe five or six, um, because some of them are circular, they are correlated, or they are, they're not really um, supported by evidence. Um, so he kind of tried to narrow down to a handful so, um, number of of orthogonal and, and mechanistic explanations for this diversity gradient. But, you know, ha retrospectively and um, analyzing what people are currently uh, still publishing on, on this topic, I can say that the debate is still there. And, and this is a bit of my personal view. I mean, what I'm going to present is not uh, a, a neutral description of the literature, is, is my view. Uh, I think we have basically not 100 or not even 20 hypothesis, we have two, or at least two main schools of hypotheses that explain this pattern. And, um, and then they have variations in, in, uh, within them. One is the ecological explanation based on, on the relationship of current climate and uh, biodiversity. And the other one is evolutionary, um, uh, evolutionary explanations, which I've been termed evolutionary time hypothesis, which I will explain. The contemporary uh, climate hypothesis or the ecological hypothesis, uh, there's two assumptions. Uh, the first one I think is the most important. Um, the one, it says that uh, the amount of resources available for conversions uh, into food, like productivity or energy times area, limits the number of individuals in, in a given region. Um, that is, the more resources there are in a given place, the more um, individuals you can have. If you have more individuals, you have more niches in the sense, more things they can, can eat. And uh, there's also more opportunities for, for speciation, all other things being equal. If you have more organisms, more, more life stuff, um, there's more opportunities for um, specialization and then eventually speciation. So it carries, I think, two important concepts. One is that resources drive biodiversity, diversity gradients, amount of resources. And the second is that there is a carrying capacity. That is, energy or somehow limits the number of species of, of individuals, therefore species that can occur in a given area. And if you look at, um, this is a map, um, this is a, on the left you see a map of um, and, uh, species richness of mammals. Um, so more species in the tropics. And then we have um, you know, Southeast Asia and Asia, uh, Eastern uh, northern coast of uh, Australia. Uh, eastern coast of the United States, etc. And then on, 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 in the bottom, you have another map. And this map is a map of productivity. 
productivity, um, that is uh, net primary productivity, which is basically measured uh, if you see uh, kilograms of carbon per meter square, square meters a year. This is the amount of carbon uh, that is generated by plants um, after they've used energy, the solar energy that, you know, for, 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 for their uh, uh, metabolism. So that, that amount of carbon is what the other organisms, the consumers, can eat. So it relates very closely to that concept of um, you know, the amount of stuff, the amount of resources that species can eat. And it, it doesn't take, it doesn't take uh, uh, you know, you don't need to be a genius or, have, or be a savvy in statistical analy analysis to see that there seems to be a, a fairly strong correlation between these two maps. So that's basically the, the, the underlying um, assumption uh, that uh, supports that, that hypothesis. Um, I don't know if you see my picture in the middle of the, of the, I'm going to move it around. Yes. Um, yeah, you see, okay. Yeah, it shouldn't be there. Maybe I can remove it. Yeah. Here. We can, dip the, the, we can uh, dive deep uh, on this topic of resources and amount of energy, and that's what we've done in a, pub, in a paper we published last, last year in Nature Communications. What we did was to, we classified every species into a guild. A guild is a, is, a, is a classification of what species eat. So it can be a frugivore, it can be a herbivore, a carnivore, carnivore being a guild and frugivore being another guild. So if we classified all of the species into what they eat and then um, classify the different parts of the world by the composition of the different guilds, what we obtain is, is a map like that. Uh, and this map really uh, correlates very, very um, neatly with climate gradients, with biomes, if you like. Uh, so you have an equatorial uh, realm with uh, different certain types of food webs. So you, this is a characterization of the trophic interactions that we have in every, in every peak zone. We, we already found six of them. So we have a, a, a humid tropical, a seasonal tropical, and a semi-arid, and then a temperate and a boreal. And you can see that these, these three here, um, what we might call the warm, the warm um, trophic structures, community trophic structures, they have many more nodes, many more guilds. Um, their networks are much more complex than the, the ones in the cold area. And this is the, the porporate one. Well, the porporate, well, the porporate exists in these gray areas, uh, but uh, they, they basically occur in deserts, but also in areas with lots of human impacts, which is not in this map, but, you know, but it's in the paper explained. So uh, when we try to look at the, 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 the climate determinants of, of this structure, we can see that the cold food webs here on the left, they're basically determined by temperature, by energy, by the, and by, by, by the amount of energy that it reaches every grid cell and the distribution of that energy throughout the year. Whereas the warm grid cells, they're not so much um, uh, discriminated by, by temperature, they are discriminated by precipitation, by, by the amount of precipitation and by the distribution of the precipitation um, throughout the year. And if you look at how these different uh, trophic structures distribute in latitude um, and how they vary in species richness, you can see that we've got the porporate here in the bottom with very low num numbers of species and basically everywhere. And then you have the boreal trophic st structures in blue, the temperate in, in, in red, and then in this peak of diversity here, the peak of richness, you have the semi-arid seasonal tropical and humid tropical. So the diversity gradients um, somehow are related to the complexity of these networks of trophic structures. The more energy, the greater the number of species, the greater the complexity of, of um, the trophic relationships as predicted by theory. The second assumption, um, this comes from a different branch of biogeography or ecology, if you like, is that species ranges are in equilibrium with current environmental conditions. That is, species occur where they're suitable um, um, climate, suitable habitat for them. Otherwise, they would be absent from unsuitable areas. Um, and core idea is this niche occupancy, dispersal, biotic interactions. I'm going to explain you briefly these graphs here. Uh, on, on, on top, you have uh, the characterization of simplest char characterization of the niche. So you have an environmental variable on the x-axis and another environmental variable on the y-axis. And the crosses are the presences. So the species would be present in this part of what we call environmental space. And they would be absent in that part here. So they would be defined by a range of temperature values or any other variable. Um, that's a kind of a, a, toy, a toy model, a general um, cartoon expectations. In, in practice, we find things like that, where the species is present in, in a given climate envelope, 
but it's also absent in that uh, envelope. And that's usually attributed to biotic interactions like competition, for example. But they might also have a pattern of being absent from an entire range, uh, an entire part of the range, uh, which wouldn't be explained by uh, biotic interactions, more likely explained by dispersal limitation. So the species would not be able to, to come in, in here. So, but, but if you think that, that the, the, the contemporary climate hypothesis for the diversity gradient implies somehow that as the climate changes, as they always do, uh, and they always have done in the past, there's a readjustment of diversity. Diversity follows those, those, those climate changes because they, 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 try to, they, they tend to be at equilibrium with, with climate. Of course, there's a time dimension. How much time does it take to, be, to, to reach equilibrium? If we look at short time, ecological time, we, we hardly find any equilibrium. And that's a very nice paper by Svenning and Skov, 2004, and they looked at a number of tree species in Europe. And they've modeled their potential climate uh, distribution. You can see these black dots here are where the, the taxa baccata, um, they, they occur, and the gray area is where they, they could occur given the climate. So they did that for about 55 species, and they found that on average, they, they occupy only about 38.3% of the ranges of the climatically suitable um, uh, ranges. That is, for the, the remaining of the area, but, but it's, 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 a, it's a false negative. They could be there, but they're not there. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a degree of non-equilibrium with, with climate, if you like. Um, this, is, this is basically a longitude and latitude in Europe, the same map, this is the Iberian Peninsula. And every dot here is the centroid of one of these uh, 55 species of trees. And the size of the centroid dictates where, uh, whether you, you are closer to equilibrium or further to equilibrium. There's some big circles is closer to equilibrium and, and uh, small circles is that they still have a long way to get to, to, to equilibrium. What this is showing, there's a north-south gradient in Europe of equilibrium. Those species with big northern and central European species, they reach the equilibrium much uh, strongly than the ones in the, in, in the Mediterranean part of, of, the, of Europe. And similar results were obtained uh, across groups. So this is an analysis that I did. Uh, I'm not going to explain the details, but basically we, we analyzed uh, a matrix of, um, of um, variation in diversity, what we call biota here, and a matrix of variation in climate. And assuming an equilibrium, we should have a very strong correlation between these two things here. This is called a mantle test. And, um, and what we found is that the correlations were fairly strong for plants, 70%, also very strong for birds, then start, start to, to decline, 61 for mammals, 55 for reptiles, 44 for amphibians. Uh, our interpretation in the paper was that these groups, particularly reptiles and amphibians, are poor dispersers and they're not being able to reach equilibrium with climate. An, an issue that I will further demonstrate um, uh, in a few slides down, down the road. So let's now go, go now for the evolutionary, the evolutionary time hypothesis. Um, I, 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 and I've been thinking a lot about this for all, over the years, and I think it, it, essentially we've got two, two different uh, hypotheses within this family of, of hypotheses. The one is about the building up of species pools, and, and maybe you don't, you're not familiar with the concept of species pool, but species pool is the number of species that is available to colonize any given area. So if you live in Lisbon, or if you live in Evora, uh, you, you may find a number of species there, right? And there's a number of species there, but that's not the total number of species that could be there. Uh, so if you actually knew how many species were able to be in Lisbon, or actually have been in Lisbon in the past, and that could still be in Lisbon or could go to Lisbon, so that would give you the, 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 the species pool. In, in general, uh, we could say that most of the species, like focus on bird species that fly and can disperse a lot, um, that live in the Iberian Peninsula or Western Europe could, could some, sometimes be in Lisbon, either because they breed there or they could breed there or they could spend the winter or they could be just uh, moving around. So the species pool is really this enormous amount of species, much, much bigger than the one that you find in a given region, but could, that could colonize without being, a, 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 as we often say, an exotic species. Right? There's species that belong to that biome and that could, be, that could move around. So um, the building of the species pool is really is something that is built over the years, over evolutionary time. And the, the, first, the first hypothesis would state that species richness would be uh, would be the outcome of, of that process. Species are differentially excluded from areas that, that they experience most 
severe climate changes or any other factor, whereas persistence and speciation would be favored by climate stability over time. So some areas, and this argues basically that the tropics have been more stable climatically over time than uh, the northern or the higher latitude regions because of the, of the, uh, the, of the Milankovitch cycles. These areas in extremes, north and south, they tend to be, to be exposed to very strong uh, climate uh, changes, uh, glaciation periods and, and warming periods. And that would cause um, uh, massive extinctions in those areas of very unstable climate. And on the other hand, much greater um, persistence uh, in the areas of stability. If you have more persistence, you have also more time for, for speciation. So the, the, the species pool would have more time to build up and become big. So that would be an explanation why there's more species in the tropics and less uh, in the higher, um, higher um, latitude uh, regions. An alternative or perhaps complementary um, hypothesis, what I call the distribution of the species pool. Um, species tend to retain their ancestral niches so that species distributions are constrained by the, dis uh, by the distribution of their um, ancestral niches. That is, if you, are, if you are born in the tropics, you cannot immediately go and jump and go and live in a in a in an Arctic region because you, you know, you're not genetically adapted. You you'd freeze. And uh, the, the the theory says, and some evidence uh, proposes that the, the you know the niches um, what what determines the tolerance of species to climate tends to evolve slower than a morphological um, uh, uh, adaptation. So evolution goes on. And, and the ancestral niches, there's ancestral tolerances to climate, this tend to not evolve at the same pace as uh, other characters. And that, that, of course, would prevent species from get, getting out of the niche. Because if, if that wasn't true, if there wasn't, that's, that's what the hypothesis proposes, if there wasn't any constraint to dispersal, uh, okay, we could have more species in the tropics, but then we do time, they would colonize the other regions, and then we would have a flat, flat relationship, you know, as many species in in higher latitudes than in, in the tropics. Well, this, this could be turned around and uh, the building up of the species pool rather than being uh, uh, the outcome of extinction and speciation associated with uh, climate stability could also be uh, because high levels of energies um, that promote high uh, increases in, in metabolic rates. So the, 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 the uh, basically evolution would go faster in the tropics than they would go in, in, in colder regions. But that's, that's debatable, that's been discussed. It might be also a, a factor. Uh, but I'm not going to, to, to further elaborate on, on this. Even that uh, hypothesis is, does not um, uh, prevent that the other hypothesis about niche uh, conservatism exists. So they, they, they basically, then, they're not competing hypotheses. They both can coexist. And that's basically a cartoon that uh, illustrates what I've just said. On, on the right-hand side, we have a phylogeny. So we have a species that is split, a split into many branches. And because of niche conservatism, only a few species were able to actually step out of, of the tropical region and go to high, high latitude. Most species were not, were not able. So that would be one that's the fact of distribution of the species pool. And then on the left side, you have what could be a characterization of the building of the species pool by climate stability. Those areas in the tropics were more stable, so they retained more species by persistence and they gave more opportunities for, 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 for speciation. This is also the same cartoon, if you believe in the, in the other uh, uh, contemporary climate hypothesis, where basically we, we have more species because areas of high energy um, allow a greater carrying capacity for individuals, therefore species. So that basically would be the same, the same cartoon. So th there's been a, a discussion, this is uh, more than, more than 40 years of discussion on that, um, 50 years. And uh, at, at, at the beginning, in the late 20th century, um, the, the most prominent uh, hypotheses were related to, to contemporary factors. And one of the reasons was that we, we, did, we have very little data to actually test the uh, historical uh, hypothesis. We had uh, some data on current diversity, um, and we had, of course, data on contemporary climate. And David Curry, Curie, uh, for example, was one of the, the most active researchers in the, in the field. And he looked at different correlations. At some point in 1991, he stated the effect of glacial history was barely discernible. Historical effects could be evident elsewhere on Earth, but evidence suggests that these effects are not long lasting. So, uh, but, but the data he had for, for glacial history was, was not nearly as good as the data he had for uh, contemporary climate. In fact, he was uh, 
for, for, for climate, you had a um, continuous variable like temperature and precipitation. And for uh, glacial history, you only had like if it had been glaciated or not, or not glaciated. Uh, so it was a, a, a one, two variable, sorry, a one, zero variable, whereas the other one had much more detail in it. So the correlations were not very good. Um, uh, Hawking, Hawkins and Porter uh, had, had used a slightly better uh, historical data and they found that current energy could explain between 76, 82 percent of the variance in species richness diversity. The time since um, uh, deglaciation explained about 8 to 13 percent. So either he said, well, con 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 contemporary factors mostly likely explain most of the, uh, uh, of the pattern, but there is a, um, a historical signal. But here, the, the historical variable was time since deglaciation. So it, it was still a very crude variable. Um, and if you think about the general patterns, so this is, this is uh, temperature uh, gradients uh, around the world. So this is from minus 100 uh, to 100 degrees. Um, this is in the middle is, uh, is the tropics. On the right is the North Pole and on the left is the, the South Pole. And you see, and that's temperature. So you see basically the temperatures around, it, uh, around the, the, these different periods, the Paleocene, Eocene, Miocene, um, Pliocene, uh, they, they remain fairly constant. The values are fairly constant um, in, in the, uh, around the equator. Uh, and there's a huge variation in, in the poles, if, especially if you go to the South Pole. Um, so for example, in the Pliocene, you had about uh, minus um, 80. 80 degrees, um, sorry, minus, yeah, 80 degrees. Uh, whereas we are, for example, in the Paleocene, it was, you know, slightly lower than zero, but, but not much lower than zero. So the, 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 really the differences were huge. So you, you, could, you, you, you can always argue whether more species in the middle is because uh, there's more energy or because there's always been more energy and the other places have been changing. So there's no time for speciation, there's massive extinctions, etc. So that's, that's a general problem. Um, that's probably the reason why it hasn't, um, we haven't uh, got a final uh, answer to this question. A very strong collinearity uh, between the different um, uh, hypotheses that explain the pattern. Uh, but a while ago, uh, we were able to test these things with a much better data set on climate. Um, and what I'm going to do is to provide now some, some empirical tests for both the climate, uh, historical climate stability and niche uh, conservatism hypothesis, that is the building up of the species pool and the distribution of the species pool. And this is because uh, finally the, the climatologists, they, they're now uh, very active uh, in doing paleoclimatology as well. So they're modeling uh, past climates with the same tools that they model the current and the future climates, except that for the past, of course, they can test, they can use the fossil record as a proxy uh, and the biology of those organisms as a, as a proxy for, for testing um, the paleoclimatic uh, reconstructions. Whereas in the future, of course, there's nothing that you can use to test. Um, but what you have here in, on the right-hand side, that's Europe, that's, that's focusing on Europe. And um, so on the right here, here you have the North Pole, and here on the left, we've got the, the Mediterranean, and that's temperature. So basically, we know that in Europe, it's colder in as, as far north as, as you move north, and it's warmer as you move south. And this is uh, precipitation. So uh, basically, there's the less clear gradient of precipitation, but there's lots of precipitation that is in intermediately high uh, in Central Europe. And this is on the right. This is the, the, the climate anomaly between the, 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 the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago and today. So, and basically this is saying, so this, this is zero here. Zero here is basically no anomaly, it's being stable. And you can see that in the Mediterranean, the, the, the anomaly was very small. There's some positive, even some positive uh, anomalies, areas that are warmer than, than today. And then areas that are colder than, than today, but we, we're talking about a range of mi minus 10 degrees, uh, and perhaps plus five degrees. Of course, there's uncertainty on in these estimates. But if you go back to, 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 towards the North Pole, we, we've got anomalies of about minus 30 degrees. So a cooling, um, uh, mi a minus you know, 30 degrees uh, uh, in the last glacial maximum. The curve is, is very similar. And here you've got the, the precipitation anomaly. Again, no clear pattern, but at the same latitudes as today, it rains more, basically it dried uh, enormously. So those areas of Central Europe that today, like Germany, Belgium, Holland, that today they, it, it rains a lot, it were basically dry, uh, dry as the rest. It was a, a homogenization. <clears throat> so 
uh, we, we looked at the, the diversity of reptiles, species reasons of uh, reptiles in Europe and amphibians in, in, in Europe. You can see that reptiles, they, they, they like it warm. They occur mainly in the, uh, in, in the south of Europe. There's more species and then uh, amphibians, well, there's more species in the south, but also a lot of species uh, in Central Europe. And when, when we actually do, did an analysis, we called a simultaneous autoregressive model, model um, to, to assess the special corrective p-values. We found that uh, if you use this historical climate stability, those, those values on, on the left graphs, uh, using the anomalies uh, between the, the, the last glacial maximum today, we have p-values, corrected p-values that are 0, 0, 1 for both temperature anomaly and precipitation anomaly. If we looked at the contemporary climate hypothesis, um, you know, we still have a very strong um, uh, p-values for temperature because basically the curves are very similar but we lose the, the, that power uh, for, um, for precipitation. So precipitation anomaly still explains more of that pattern than, um, than, so the history of climate explains more than the current uh, climate. If we look at R squares, um, this, the, the first model, the historical climate uh, stability model is one where we start by assuming that climate uh, um, stability is the main factor. And then we look at, at the residuals and see how much they explain by, by the other variable. And this is important because when, once you have these, when, when you use these, these, um, um, these approaches where, where you kind of sequester the variance from a given hypothesis and then look at the, the residuals, uh, if there's co-variation between the variables, you are kind of excluding the, vari the, the variance that also pertain to the other hypothesis. So what you see here is basically asymmetrical things. If you start with climate st stability, uh, reptiles uh, are, you know, 51% is explained by, by climate stability, both um, temperature and precipitation, and 40% for amphibians. And if you look uh, at the residuals, the contemporary climate would explain 44 and 26 um, for amphibians. If you do the other way around, you start with contemporary climate and look for um, <coughs> climate stability in the residuals, you basically get the, the same thing. So uh, essentially what we're showing is that in Europe for amphibians and reptiles, the history of climate uh, is, has a stronger um, explanatory power of diversity gradients than um, current, uh, current, power, current, current um, climate. And we were really puzzled by this. So we kind of did some visual inspection of, of results. And the, the thing we did uh, is we'll look at, at the, the most uh, rare species, the top 5% uh, rarest species. And it has to, one thing we know in, in ecology and biogeography is that being rare is very, is very, is very common. So most species actually tend to be rare uh, rather than common. Uh, and if you look at the rare species, they all, all occur down in the south of, um, of Europe. And then we, we map with this line here, uh, we mapped it for the sake of curiosity. Uh, curiosity. This is the zero, the zero degree isotherm in the LGM, in the last glacial maximum. So below this line, um, it was above, on, on average, above zero degrees, and uh, above the line, it was uh, zero degrees. So it seems as though this, this, this refugia, the sudden climate refugia of, um, during the, the last glacial maximum still relates very strongly to those areas of, of strong endemism, of strong uh, proportion of rare species of, of um, reptiles. If we look at the common species, now we go to the extreme common species, the 5% common species, and they basically everywhere. There's, of course, there's a preponderance in the south, but they, there's, they, they are everywhere. And perhaps they would be limited by the zero degree isotherm today. So this is the current zero degree isotherm where there's only one species, this one in blue here, only one species can actually live there. All of the other species live below that line. So it seems as though that there's this historical signature was preserved uh, for these organisms, which supports somehow the idea that climate stability can have a strong, a strong association with uh, diversity gradients. Of course, we're not talking here about the global diversity gradient, we're talking about Europe. Um, so let's now look at uh, effect of niche uh, conservatism. Uh, we start by a very simple set of um, hypotheses. So if diversity gradients are driven by niche conservative, then we would predict uh, diversity gradients among clades originated in different periods to be different. Um, so uh, differences should, should reflect the an ancestral climate shaping species niches. So uh, this is not a finalized ana an analysis. It's actually, uh, 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 I only have visual stuff to show you. And before I actually show the results, I'll like just to explain this graph here. This is, this is a, a, a graphical tool to explore correlations among two variables, variable one and variable two. 
uh, if the two variables were per perfectly correlated, it would be around this line here. And then any map of correlations that you see would be black and white. You see, in a very strong correlation between two variables would be white. Very low correlation between, between the two variables would be black. And in between, you've got the shades of gray. So this map here is basically the same variable against the same variable. And this shows is diversity against diversity. And it shows areas in, in these areas in, in white with very high numbers of diversity and very, in areas in um, black, very low numbers of, di of diversity and intermediate um, levels. So now what we did was to look at, so we dated uh, every family uh, of reptile in the world. We, 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 were, we were able to do it for about 74% of the world's families. And uh, we looked at those that originated during the Cretaceous period. And that's the diversity of families, not species. The families dated, during, uh, dated to have originated in the Cretaceous period. And that is the diversity of, uh, of families of reptiles that um, have been dated to, to um, originate in the tertiary period. You see that they're not exactly the same. And if you overlay the two, there's a, a correlation of 74%, which is quite high. In a white, there's basically areas, so you know, the typical uh, high diversity areas of the tropics where we have both very high numbers of families from the, ter the tertiary and the Cretaceous. And then in blue, we have areas which have an excess of species from uh, families uh, of reptiles from the Cretaceous. And in green, areas with higher numbers of families um, originated in the, in, the, in the tertiary. Now, this is a very crude uh, analysis, but the Cretaceous period is the warmest period uh, for quite a long time. Uh, it's also the warmest and, and driest. There's lots of deserts. And these areas here, um, basically these areas of blue, they tend to be very dry areas. So you have the Australian uh, Sahara Desert, uh, Madagascar, and then, well, these are not so dry, but they have in, in, in the United States a slightly more um, complex pattern. Again, here you have another desert. And um, the, the, the tertiary, the, mo the most recent clades, they tend to originate in temperate regions. Both in South America, in Africa, and um, in Europe. So there seem to be a, a, a retention of the ancestral um, niches of the, these families today, even today, after a period of more than 60 million years, years <clears throat> which supports this view of, of niche um, conservative, a very low, uh, slow evolution of, of the traits that determine the tolerances of species, or in this case, families, to climate. Another test. Uh, we assume that if diversity patterns are dri driven by niche conservatism, then the slopes of diversity gradients, you know, from very high diversity in the tropics and lower in the, in the, in the higher high latitudes, should differ among species originated in different, spe in, in, in different spe periods. Diversity of species originated in warm periods should have steep slopes between the, trop the, the, the equator and, and the temperate regions. And uh, species that did not originate in warm periods, that originated in cold periods, uh, should not have steep slopes. So what we did was we, we looked at, so this is the history of climate uh, since 70, 750 million years and uh, until today. And the colors reflect a qualitative rank of, of temperatures. So we have the Cretaceous period here, here as I mentioned before, was the warmest um, uh, period in a long time, at least 700, 750, 100 million years. And then we, had, we, 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 we reviewed 343 um, studies assessing uh, contemporary gradients of diversity for a wide uh, range of taxa and environments. And for each one of the taxa, we dated them again and eclipsed them to the, to the, 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 the climate they had, um, the global climate they had uh, at the time of their uh, origination. And this is the, one of the results. So this is the, the, the steepness of the gradients, the highest the steepness um, the, no, that the, the greater the difference between the diversity in the tropics and, uh, and, um, and the high, high latitudes. And what we find is that uh, as climate, as the origination of the climate was warmer, uh, they, they basically tend to have a steep gradient, as we predicted. That is, these, these guys originated in a very warm period, and, and they have today uh, a latitudinal gradient that mimics what we would expect if they were not able to colonize uh, temperate regions. Uh, this, the, the Cretaceous here, is sli is a slight, it seems like a slight uh, outlier. Our interpretation is because there was lots of desert species here, and the desert species, they do not conform with, with the latitudinal uh, pattern, uh, as, we, as, we, as we predict. 
And this is the same, but we reorganize the data by marine and terrestrial. We only have three classes now. And again, the pattern seems to be the same, except again, here with the top in the terrestrial system. Uh, this is messed up because of, of, of the desert. So this analysis also supported uh, uh, this hypothesis. So uh, concluding remarks, I think I'm running out of time, so if you want to have some discussion. Uh, the amount of energy at any given place is related to the amount of resources available. That's obvious, right? So if there's more energy, more solar energy and water, there's going to be more plants. If there's more plants, there's more resources because all of the consumers somehow depend on, on the plants. And if there's uh, more um, resources and given enough time, uh, there's more time to, um, to evolution and to establishment of complex networks of consumers, of interactions. And the more resources, the more individuals, and the more individuals, the more opportunities for speciation. So that's basically a, a fairly solid hypothesis rooted in the contemporary um, climate hypothesis, except that, of course, it, it requires time for the building up of the species pool. But it would be energy. It would be energy, the ultimate driver. Um, and, of course, um, would be the driver of the of, 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 of patterns. Now we can look at climate stability. Climate stability um, offers a parsimonious explanation of diversity gradients, as, as we've seen. We predict distributed rule among clades, especially those with poor dispersal abilities. Um, that is, the ones that cannot move, they will not be able to recolonize other areas. Particularly important. Um, when diversity grains include areas are, are subject to climate, uh, uh, to cyclical and intense um, climate changes. So when you compare um, the northern hemisphere with, with sorry, sorry uh, high latitude uh, regions and lower latitude regions, the steepness of this variation in the, in the intensity uh, of climate changes might be so strong that it will leave uh, a, a signal in, in, in the relationships. But with good dispersers, the climate stability, the signal might be lost and be only discernible among um, the rarest species. To address the latitudinal diversity gradient, niche conservatives offers a powerful mechanism, as we've seen in, in, with two tests. And evidence for niche conservatives does not contradict alternative hypotheses, but it highlights the need for more specific predictions that enable distinction among different uh, hypotheses. Now, this, the, the problem, I, I, I've basically argued that the three hypotheses are well, it's actually two hypotheses with the niche conservatism being a one that is actually complementary because it's about dispersal. So it, 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 it can be coupled with any of, of the other two. Um, it's, it's a different, it's a completely different mechanism. And, and to move ahead, uh, uh, what of course we'd like to have another planet. If we had another planet with a different history, uh, we could perhaps test these things because the problem is that today, areas of high diversity, area, that also have high energy, but also have high climate stability. So there's a correspondence between climate stability and energy that makes it almost impossible to tease apart what is the contribution of uh, one and the other. Of course, you can use um, savvy statistical methods, but they're still going to be based on correlations. So suppose we have a different planet. Uh, this is a planet with a pattern where this is our planet with our, our, our current pattern. Um, diversity is determined by climate stability and energy. They both coincide, so they both could explain this pattern. But now suppose a different planet. We had a different planet where energy was basically the same as it is in our planet, the same distribution, but climate stability was, was opposite. If it, if it was climate stability determining the pattern, this is what we would obtain, right? You'd have higher diversity in the higher, higher latitudes in, in general, and you'd have lower, lower diversity in these areas here, in this hypothetical planet. If the planet had, um, if, if instead of, of, of climate stability, the main mechanism was energy, um, and if both somehow affected, we would have a pattern like that. Because there would be one mechanism would probably cancel um, the other one. And this is the one where, um, well, this is with uh, climate stability um, referring. Of course, we don't have another planet, so this is impossible. This is just, this is a cartoon, this is a, a, a wish. If I could have another planet, if the, if the astrobiologists found another planet with teeming, you know, full of life like ours, the biogeographists would come and say, look, this is a, a, an independent planet where I can test my hypothesis about diversity, which is the ultimate mechanism explaining those, those patterns. So it doesn't exist at the moment. We don't have that planet. 
So what is the alternative? And the alternative is to run simulations. And uh, there was a paper um, uh, two years ago by Rangel and Rob Powell and others uh, in science, and, and they de de developed a fairly complex simulation model, which we call the, a general mechanistic simulation model, where the different uh, hypotheses that I explained here, uh, they were formulated um, and parameterized differently. So basically they had, they had a range of different simulations that would generate a pattern of diversity. And this pattern of diversity with different assumptions was then uh, compared with the real, with the real pattern. Um, for example, here you have um, on, on, on these maps on the left, observed species regions of birds and observed species regions of mammals. And this is um, one of their, of their simulation model. Um, uh, they, they can then um, correlate with um, observed patterns. So, th so that's a way to step away from the very naive view of, of silver bullet uh, mechanisms, like it's either climate stability or either energy. It actually can be both. And um, dispersal is obviously a very important mechanism. So the, 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 these, these, these simulation models allow us to go away from this very simple correlation where we try to oppose different mechanisms and see which one is the ultimate mechanism that drives the whole thing. And we can actually have them combined together and look at different parts of the planet at different spatial scales, also different temporal scales, and see how, how the, different, uh, uh, the different mechanisms they, they, they interact among the, the themselves in order to generate a pattern, which is then tested against uh, real data. And uh, this is my last slide. And I think this is uh, probably the future uh, when we have to test uh, hypotheses for which we don't have any independent data to test. Thank you very much. I'm willing to take some questions. Thank you very much. Really good uh, to see your perspective on the biodiversity. So this is uh, time for, for questions. I, uh, just a <coughs> reminder, we have, uh, we, are, we are seeing this, this uh, talk on understanding species diversity. Next week, same hour, Monday, we'll have a talk on, on uh, reptiles and amphibians. This one is, will be in Portuguese. And the next one, it will be about the evolution of marine turtles. And I will send in the, in the comments the link to follow the, the scientific snacks. Now, time for questions. Question, anyone? Yes, you can make questions by in using the, the text as well. English or Portuguese. So I have one that really puzzles me. Um, we don't know the, we really don't know how was that biodiversity in the past. We know how is the fossil record from the past, but not how, how does represent the diversity. So do you think we are, the fossil record shows we have a, a regular increase in, diver in biodiversity in Cambrian. Do you think this is a, a steady pace or um, rapidly we reach a, a, a maximum point of biodiversity, meaning bi biodiversity won't grow much more than what is now, and it's been like this over, over the millions of years, or we are, biodiversity is just a a subproduct of, uh, of evolution and biodiversity will carry on during time. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, um, a one million dollar question, right? I know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, from ecology, a big debate that existed over the years is whether there is a carrying capacity of, of the systems. Where, for example, if you go to an island, islands are, are nice systems to study these things because they're kind of they're contained in space. and. Um, now people are, are, know, are seeing that with invasions of species, there's more species coming in because of humans are, are transporting species um, to, to those islands. And <clears throat> one of the predictions from conservation biology is that those new species invading the islands would drive others to extinctions, right? It would be a catastrophe. And uh, they would go away because of invasive species would, would drive them to, to extinction. But, but that's not supported by, by data. What we're seeing is that as more species reach the islands, uh, because they are transported by people uh, at a rate much higher than they, they colonize naturally those islands. Uh, 
they are finding their niche. They, they're finding their way in the island system. Um, you know, they, they, they've got this space. They, they might cause a local extinction in some place, but by and large, the overall numbers are going up. So and the, the debate in island biology and invasive biology is, so when do we see the end of, of this growing, of, of this growth? Is, is there actually an ending? If, and if there is, have you reached that ending at um, anywhere in the world? And, um, and, we have, and, and there's no evidence for that. So it, it, may, it may well be possible that there's still room in, in the planet for uh, many more species. Of course, now there's a human factor, right? And the human factor, um, we, we appropriate, um, I think it's about 40% of the, of the net primary production of the planet. So the, all of the biomass produced by, by plants is appropriate, you know, 40% is appropriate by us. Um, that's competition. So if, if, we, if we remove all of that energy, we kind of uh, depress uh, biodiversity. And that's what's happening at, at the moment. But, but, but if we excluded that, that human element, um, and if we assume that um, evolution would keep its space, uh, probably we would see a, a continuous increase in, in diversity until a given moment, um, until, until we reached a ceiling. But, but that ceiling might be much bigger um, than, um, than we have seen uh, so far. Um, so for example, if you look at the tropics, what happens in, in the tropics? You have a, compl uh, a complexification of, of the food webs, of the networks of interactions. So there's many more, the organisms specialize, they become, they, they become more narrow in the types of resources they use. They also are, become smaller in size, because of course if you are smaller, you know, 10 small organisms can eat the same amount of energy as a, a big organism. So in a way to increase diversity is to reduce the size of the organisms. And also to reduce the range, uh, you know, one, one common feature in the tropics is that there's many, many species, but there's also many more rare species. Um, so those rare species, those species that only occur in a very specific region, um, they, they give space for other species to occupy other regions. So there's a very strong turnover um, in the distribution of species. So both reduction in body size, specialization, you know, tropic specialization, or ecological specialization, and reduction in range sizes. <clears throat> seem to be um, a response to increasing diversity. So, you know, you just re re reduce um, or, or modify the, those parameters and suddenly you can have more species per unit area uh, than if you are in another area where the, you know, the, the body masses are larger, etc. So it, 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 may, it may well be possible. And I, I'm no paleontology, but I, I think one of, the, one of the features that if, if you look at the fossil record, there's been a tendency for slow, for, for reducing the size of organisms, isn't that, Octavio? You had many, you know, very large organisms uh, many million years ago, and suddenly we live in a world of, uh, of lilyboots. What's uh, happening is actually the contrary. We have the Coke rule, so organisms tend to increase the size during stable times, but during crisis, the large ones get extinct. Right. So dinosaurs reach a, a, gigant, a gigantic size during the entire Mesozoic, but yeah. when there was a crisis, they were the first to get extinct. Yeah, but I mean, these moments of crisis, you, 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 you can see them as a moment of lack of resources. Um, suddenly, okay. there's, there's no resources, right? So, so the ones that, that survive are, are those that can just to, to feeding on smaller amounts of resources having a higher turnover. All right. Well, uh, um, thank you very much. Any, uh, we have a question that uh, pop up um, by chat is asking um, if you can give a point of view about the marine biodiversity gradients and the future of the topic. I'm, I'm, not, a marine person. I'm not a marine person. Um, so I guess it's everything I can say about marine it's um, it's it's not it's not uh, with great uh, insight, but um, um, the patterns. I mean, I, I wouldn't dare to venture. It seems that the pattern is the same in in, in marine systems, but uh, in terms of diversity, um, th then there's there's issues of body mass that that modify a, a little bit the the, the patterns. I would like, and there's uh, human um, intervention and human impacts, etc. But I mean, by and large, the diversity gradients is, seems to follow the same, the same diversity, not biomass, because the biomass seems to be greater in, in, in high, higher latitudes, but not diversity. So the, there's something else going on there, uh, but I'm, I haven't been giving much thought on it. It's a different world. All right, more questions, please? 
I, I have one one question. So in that in that work, uh, but first, uh, thanks for the talk. It's, uh, it was really interesting. Then uh, I like to ask, uh, you use it like all the families that the their origin is located during the Cretaceous, during the whole Cretaceous, for that study. No? Yes. See, so I mean, the, the distribution maps are today, uh, are of today. Um, but we looked at we looked at, uh, at um, Bentham works, and 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 we dated, uh, which is based on on, on dating of fossils. Uh, so it's not date on on, on phylogenies or anything like that. And uh, <clears throat> and we classified every family from from their origin, and then looked at the present day distributions of the families uh, that have different um, origins. Okay. Because the, th the thing is like the, the Cretaceous is 80 million years long, so uh, the, it's bigger than the other periods that you put together. So maybe you are, uh, when you see that signal that is a little bit of the trend, it mm -hmm. might be because you are averaging a lot of time there. It could be, it could be. I mean, there's, there's so many things that, that can affect these results. I mean, they, they, that's... The reason why they haven't been published yet, it's because there's many complications um, that we still haven't solved. Um, one of them is that we wanted to date these things with molecular phylogenies, and this is taking a little bit more time. And, um, and then we, you know, we want to do some, some more complex um, analysis. But um, yeah, I mean, also the, 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 the climate projections in the past, they go down very raw. I mean, this could also be a very, you know, there's uh, the tertiary period uh, includes warm period, cold periods, um, and um, the Cretaceous period is also not uniform. We, we tend to see it as a very warm period and the, the most warm period, but, but, but there was also uh, fluctuations uh, during that time. So we can't really pinpoint when exactly or even when uh, those clades were originated. They might have originated, say, in, um, in Antarctica. In which case they were originated in a in a temperate uh, climate, not in a tropical climate. So I mean it's 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 very difficult. But I mean our our signal it's, nevertheless is interesting to see that uh, th those Cretaceous families they they cluster they tend to cluster enormously uh, in areas or uh, in, in in the desert or at least um, the ones in, in in the tertiary don't have that pattern. Um, they they share the same level of speciation, you know, numbers of species. Um, in, in, in the tropics, there's basically tertiary and Cretaceous species in, in the tropics in roughly e e equal numbers, um, but not but not uh, in temperate regions where there's more tertiary um, uh, species um, in temperate regions and um, in the Cretaceous having more in the desert. If that is a real signal or something that is confounding by some aspect of the data, I mean, I don't know. I think nobody knows. <laughs> Well, once you start doing these kind of investigations um, over the past, um, you may find a signal and it fits your storyline very well. But another day, somebody else might come and say, well, but there's this other element that corrupts your interpretation, then you have to go back again. So that's the history of, of um, that's the history, that's the history of science, but I think it's even more uh, in paleontology or um, historical biogeography where we really have to play with small pieces of a very large puzzle and we have very little evidence to tell the story, much less than, than, than in other branches of science. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thanks for the, uh, for the answer. Thank you. There are also a very interesting um, paper that uh, discusses the distribution of uh, dinosaurs in latitude and showing there is a anti-equatorial distribution. Okay. Which I doubt, though. I think it's it's more a bias of of um, of the the fossil record. But the, the data shows there is more species in temperate zones than in the equator. Period. Yeah. Uh, the, the the trouble, of course, is that the fossil record gets destroyed uh, very quickly in tropical areas, isn't it? And it gets preserved in dry areas, cold and dry areas. So the, the data would inherently have a bias. Correct. But I'll, um, if you can, you, you know, I'll, I'll love you to send me this, this paper. Have a look. Right. I guess it, it would be interesting to look at the phylogenies of these uh, dinosaurs. 
uh, try to understand if there's some missing branches um, because probably there are right so, uh, you, are, you are you are finding a new species of, uh, of dinosaurs almost every year <clears throat> but um, almost every week yeah but, uh, but probably not in a in the amazon rainforest correct those are in amazon they're really rare they exist but they are really rare yeah all right more questions meanwhile i'll send two links here for for everybody all right uh miguel any question no, I was. I need to re listen to the talk again <laughs> carefully too, because there are too many th interesting things. I really like it. Um, Thank you. All right. If there is no other questions, um, thank you very much, Professor Miguel Barcelo, uh, uh, my dear, my dear. Um, well, I would say friends. Despite we don't see it for many years. Um, uh, one final question and that's related with uh, with your career i mean you have an, an amazing career with a with such a, a publication record um how do you manage what's what's the the secret behind a uh, uh, um, a career with so many papers uh, what's your uh, advice for a, a young or less young uh, researcher that we should have half of your impact? Um, I guess this would be another hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, uh, I mean, I've never been, I've never been very strategic um, about these things. I, I have colleagues and I know people that uh, are thinking about these things and how, what should they do to have a, a good career? Um, so my what I, I was I was um, I think my, my main trait is that I was really stubborn. Um, I, I, have, I was passionate about what I was doing, as you are, um, and I spent a lot of time working. Um, so when I was um, late twenties, I, I would go out of from work, um, you know, late evening on Friday night, and you know, every one of my age was 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 in the bars having having fun, and I was going home. Um, so that for quite a long time. So I had, I, I did, I took my options of working a lot. I think part of the, the you know, the, the, the most important trait of a, of a scientist, I think, is uh, the ability to focus for a very long time on questions for which you don't, you don't have an answer. And so being stubborn, being focused, and, and to do that, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. So find, find your passion and following it. So that's, that's one element, but uh, of course, many people do that, right? So, uh, I think the other thing is I, I was I was lucky. I was lucky in the sense that my passion became became fashionable, became trendy. So when I started to work on climate change, um, early two thousands, uh, it was not because I had a perception that this would become a trendy issue. It was just because I liked it and because it followed naturally from the questions I had in my mind. During during my PhD, I wasn't working in climate change, but uh, I was working in conservation biology and in the definition of um, reserve systems for, for biodiversity. But the next question was, how, what would happen if climate changes? If you're setting a, a nature reserve and everything changes around because of climate, how, how do you adapt your, your protected areas, your, your reserves to, 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 to the conservation? And that's how I became involved in climate change because it was the, the natural question to have. And <clears throat> maybe you know, five years, maybe around 2005, the thing exploded, you know, after 2005, the thing exploded and I had been working on it for five years. So I had, a, a, let's say, a, an advantage over other, other researchers. Like for now, for now, for example, if you are an, an epidemiologist, and then there are not many around. I mean, if you look at how many people, for example, in Portugal specialize in um, epidemiology, I mean, not, maybe a handful or, or less. So if you, if you happen to, to be working in a, in a given topic for many years, and suddenly there's a huge demand for people working in that field, and there's a huge boom of funding, and people are you know, they're putting my resources, and lots of people are studying the topic. Uh, that's, that's the element of luck, right? Uh, and that, I was lucky in that sense, because I was working already in a topic that uh, became fashionable. If I was um, 
epidemiologist now and I suddenly started to work on, on COVID-19 uh, and I was very good in, in that. Um, that would completely redefine my, my career. As, I, as I'm noticing some, some, some young um, epidemiologists, suddenly they are, they are bursting in papers and, 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 um, and, and uh, visibility, right? So, but I think, you know, is, is that old idea that, uh, of course, there, are, there, there is luck in the world, but it needs to find you working. Um, so I think, you know, the most important feature, you cannot be hunting for luck. Uh, it either comes or it doesn't. But the most important feature is that you focus, you, you find your passion and you work hard to, to, to be, I mean, to make a, a contribution um, in, in that field. Um, I think that's the most important um, characteristic of a research. I mean, when I, when I interview PhD students, for example, uh, for, for a job, um, for, to, to, to give them a grant, uh, I see many of my colleagues uh, looking at um, how they fared at school, right? Uh, what were the, the marks at, at university? Um, I, I don't, I couldn't care less. I mean, um, of course, uh, marks, are, it's important to have good marks, but that's not, that's not the main, I mean, someone that is very good at everything is not necessarily a good researcher. Someone that is very good at, at, at everything, it's a mind that is flexible, that can be perhaps a very good CEO of a big, com of a big, big multinational company being multitasking, being able to solve lots of different problems, right? Um, but these guys might be bored if they are given five years to just find an answer to one question. So uh, that's not, you know, if, if you want to find a, a good researcher, is that man, like you, Octavio, that since a childhood you were uh, passionate about the dinosaurs, and you still are. Um, so that, I think, is a, is a characteristic of, um, of, of a good researcher, someone that follows the passion. And you know, I, I said in an interview, it's a bit of a almost in 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 part in some components of life is not it's not very good. It might even be considered a disease or a problem. But in research, it's a quality because I mean, the first test, the PhD, is a five or four years um, project on one topic. <laughs> a lot of people just get depressed and give up, or uh, they even if enough you give up because the supervisor helps finishing right but they might get demoralized and barely finished finish with help um, so that you know that person clearly is not is not prepared to have a scientific career might, might be a good lecturer at university because that's a different uh, profile the lecturer um, has to 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 be a scholar has to know a, a lot about a lot of, of things and be a good uh, communicator but the the, the, the but when you're talking about uh, the researcher as a profession, um, you know, that, that capacity to focus, that obsession, that passion, uh, I think is the most important uh, characteristic. I don't know if, if I answered your... Yeah, your, yes, your, you did. Uh, you did. Uh, I wish we had um, a magical recipe to say to our students, but uh, passion is a good, it's a good one. Um, any question in the audience? If not, once again, it, Miguel Barcerujo, thank you very much. Um, was a, was a really good. If um, if uh, if you don't mind, we'll put your talk on online if you accept it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Next week, same hour, seventeen uh, hundreds. Uh, Monday on reptiles and amphibians from Portugal with Luis Rio and then the evolution of, of turtles. So every Monday, uh, five o'clock in this address. Thank you all. Keep safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Maravilha. Espetacular. Um, epa, uh, uh, tenho a memória tão vívida daquele, daquele tempo que nós fomos para o campo um,